Hello again, everybody. Great to have you along as we continue on with yet another edition of Journey Through Sports and Life. And once again, we've got yet another rock star from the sports world that we're delighted. <laughs> Here we are uh, approaching the holiday season, Christmas, Hanukkah, the new year is just around the corner. But in the meantime, we're delighted to welcome you all. My name is Scott Murray. And again, I'm right here with the M&M girls, the, uh, the dynamic duo of twins. Introduce yourself, ladies. How are you? Hi. I'm doing great. I'm Marjorie Herrera Lewis. And thank you, Scott. Marnie Schneider here. And there's some fellow by the name of Thrill Hill. Does that bring back memories from the 1980s? Member of the Dallas Cowboys coming out of Stanford back in uh, 77. And the very next year, he goes on to uh, be a part of uh, one of the greatest teams of all time. I'm talking about the Dallas Cowboys of the 70s. And they went on to beat the Denver Broncos. And that was in Super Bowl 12 in New Orleans. And the Cowboys picked up their second Super Bowl in team history. And who was one of the great wide receivers? Somebody by the name of Honey Hill, number 80. How are you, my friend? Yeah, I'm doing awesome. Uh, Scott, but my, my only mistake was the fact that I didn't hire you to be my agent. What, what a delivery. <laughs> what an intro. I can't be that. You know, I, I just can't beat that. Well, I never even mentioned that you were a member of the, uh, the Cowboys uh, outstanding, the All-100 team. And, of course, uh, you, you got that Super Bowl ring back in Super Bowl XII, three-time Pro Bowler, coming out of Stanford. Doesn't get much better than that when you come out of a university here in the good old U.S. of A. So uh, we're delighted to welcome you. We're really excited about uh, having you on board today. Well, hey, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm delighted to be with the M&M girls. I can't beat that. When I was playing, it was a, it was a TNT connection, Tony Dorsett and Tony Hill. So now I've got the M&M connection. I like it. <laughs> Doesn't get much better than that, does it? <laughs> I'm moving up in the alphabet, right? You got it. <laughs> That's you hilarious. It. Well, I tell you what, we just have a lot of fun talking about your, your great history. Certainly, you know, coming out of Stanford back in 77, going the Dallas Cowboys and and then, of course, uh, get that Super Bowl ring in just your second year. But, of course, the great history that you had with the Dallas Cowboys, with, you know, Butch Johnson and Drew Pearson and Doug Donnelly and some of the great wide receivers that uh, that uh, were right there with the Cowboys in the late 70s, early 80s, and and uh, just really excited. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a take a break here, and uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll be back with lots more and talk to our special guest, Tony Hill, Tony Hill, on this edition of journey through sports and life. So don't you go away. Welcome back to journey through sports and life. Marty and Marjorie and yours truly Scott with uh, the great one. We're talking about Tony Hill, the man known as Thrill Hill, number 80 for the Dallas Cowboys back in the 70s and 1980s. Tony, again, it's great to have you on board. Just bring us up to date before we move on with our interview and what have you. What are you doing now? Well, what I'm doing now, <clears throat> I'm preparing for retirement. How about that, Scott? Uh, <laughs> I've, um, I was with the city of Allen for about 20 years. I was a man. I oversaw all the recreation for the city of Allen. I oversee all the special events. Um, you know, I, I work with a company called Compass Media or Westwood One. I work with the Dallas Cowboys. And, of course, um, just, <clears throat> just um, preparing for a, a huge uh, party that I'm going to have, a retirement party on June, I mean, January 7th, and yours truly, the, the infamous uh, Scott Murray is going to MC that, but I've got several right. of my great colleagues that are coming out. I've got Tony Dorsett, Drew Pearson, Roger Staubach, um, Doug Donnelly, Doug Cosby, Jimmy Newsom. i got a bunch of guys that are coming out that I'm looking forward to reuniting with, along with my other friends, and so that's what I'm currently doing. I, I'm currently preparing for retirement. I've got three grandkids. Oldest one is three. The youngest one is one. It was a miracle because I didn't think my kids were going to have any kids at all. I thought they'd wait till I was 75, but they kind of beat me. So that's good. I'm in good place. <laughs> and just so our listeners know, Alan is how far north of Dallas? Uh, Alan's probably about 30 miles north of Dallas over here. You go through with the uh, suburbs of Richardson, Tech, or that North Dallas, Richardson, Texas, and then Plano, Texas, right. uh, then Allen, Texas. Then you move out to Gosh, McKinney and, and Frisco, Texas, the star and all the big things, the home of the Cowboys. So that's, I'm right in that proximity. That's right. So it's nice that you have stayed in the area, didn't go back oh. to California. No, no, absolutely. That's, that's funny you should mention that, Marjorie, because Tony, really, there's so many, all the guys you mentioned, you know, 99% of them are still in Dallas. They all stayed here, even though they might have come from, just like yourself, you're from California, you went to Stanford. Uh, yeah, but you, everybody comes back to Dallas or stays in Dallas. Why, why is that? What is it about the, 
the you know the, the Texas area and the Dallas Fort Worth area that everybody hangs around, even though most of them weren't even from here. Well, I, you know, I got to be upfront with you. Of course, you expect me to be that way, but the thing that I miss from California, of course, is some friends, uh, but most certainly the smell of the ocean. I mean, I just can't miss mm -hmm. that. I, I'm from Long Beach, California. I'm approximately five miles from the ocean, so you can smell it from my house. You can feel the salt water in the air. Um, but bottom line is that one, the cost of living. I really like the lifestyle I have here. Number one, compared to California. Uh, number two, the people. Uh, you know, the people in Texas are awesome. And then three, being the uh, you know fourth all-time leading or fifth all-time leading receiver with the Cowboys and third in all-time yardage. It has its perks. You know, it, it keeps me with Scott and Marnie and Marjorie. You know, if I was somewhere else, this may not happen. So I can't beat this in there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great environment for the kids. I mean, that's another thing that, that really holds up. I'm, you know, I've had four kids. It's my wife and I have four kids. My oldest daughter is Cassidy, uh, Kelly, Leslie, and Anthony, and who now have their own kids. And so this is a great environment to raise a kid as well. No, that's a good point. That's a very good point. I, I can ditto that on you. You know, my son and my daughter, both, you know, raised here in the great state of Texas. So totally understand. Well, I'll tell you, you know, what. I was, uh, yeah, just I'm real quick. Over to the, the girls, Marty and Marjorie. Uh, go ahead. Jump on well, board, Marjorie. I was just going to say on that theme, uh, I was covering the team during the 1988 season, and I was pregnant with my oldest. And, um, you know, I was due in February, so, this, you know, it's getting pretty big during late in the season. And Ernie Stautner used to come into the interview room and block for me. He said, I'll, I'll be your lead block and get you to the front of the interview room. It was really a lot of fun. Well, I tell but, you what, he'd be, he'd be a guy I'd want to have in front of me as well. So you, yeah, you had exactly. a good choice. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, you got and, that right. And everyone was trying to get me to name my, not my, which turned out to be a daughter, but everybody was trying to get me to name, you know, name Jim, name Herschel, Jason, name Tony, yeah. you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. It was a good time. So I know what Absolutely. you mean about raising a family though. It's been great, but but I'd like to hear Marnie's story here. She was starting to say something when we were off the air and I think this is gonna be hilarious. So Marnie, why don't you go to your story? Especially well, if I made you cry, Marnie. <laughs> yeah. I know you did, yes. Uh, you definitely did. You didn't even know it, but uh, again, this is what great uh, football players do often to fans. So I was a young girl living in Philadelphia and my grandfather, Leonard Toes, owned the Philadelphia Eagles. So um, pretty much twice a year uh, during the late 70s and 80s, I would um, be crying because I would say, oh, we're going to win the game. We're going to win the game, Grandpa. And then two minutes later, towards the, you know, the two-minute drive at the end of the game, uh, no, that was not going to happen. <laughs> Tony Hill's catching passes and running into the end zone, and I'm <laughs> Uh, crying, you know, a crying young girl, crying teenager. And uh, yes, but again, it's hard to not appreciate the talent on the field. So I uh, definitely have matured and have, you know, certainly moved on from, from those uh, really kind of um, outbursts of like, I cannot believe this, what just happened moments. Why can't we get a Tony Hill on the team? Uh, but yeah, so thank you for, uh, for just being such a great athlete and great, a great person, uh, that really is what kind of does it. I met Rod Martin a few years ago. And again, you know, when I met Rod and he likes to refer to himself as um, Ron Jaworski's third leading receiver in Super Bowl 15. <laughs> so that's kind of mean and um, true, but mean. And so I was like, tell me your story. And he has such a great story. So again, it's like the stories about what people are doing on and off the field, no matter how much heartbreak there might've been at one point, it really dissipates because of all the great things that you're doing to be a leader. And that is really what is so lovely and special. So thank you, Tony, for all the things that you've done uh, over the past couple you know, decades. Hey, Scott, my add on to that just real quickly. Uh Hey, it's interesting that you had mentioned uh, Rod Martin. Rod and I are really good friends. I haven't talked to him in a while, but we used to be very close. I used to have a company called Spread, uh, Legend Sports Promotions, and we used to travel the country, all over the country, doing public appearances, speaking engagements, autograph sessions, and special events using former athletes. And Rod was one of the guys that we always, you know, would come to. And, of course, he'd always talk about Ron Jaworski. Actually, he used to talk about Danny White, was one of his favorite quarterbacks, but it seemed like he was one he could get into. But to, go on, but to go a little further, though, Mar Marnie, the, my greatest game, not necessarily my greatest game, my most successful game on the field, 
as far as terms of catching was against the Philadelphia Eagles. And it just so happened the greatest cowboy, the greatest quarterback in cowboy history. And from my, my I'm, I'm a little biased, but from that standpoint, I think one of the greatest quarterbacks ever was Roger Staubach. And we were playing, uh, playing Philadelphia at Texas Stadium. I had seven catches for 213 yards. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing about that it was against Philadelphia. Herm Edwards is over there, if you remember him. Of and, course. Uh, Wes Hopkins and those guys. But long story short, in that game, in that particular game, I had seven catches for 213 yards. But five of those passes that I caught weren't even on the in the game plan. Ro, I said, Roger, I can beat a guy on a certain play. Roger said, hey, I'll call this play. I'm looking on the backside, and he threw him to my I had a 75-yard catch and a 71-yard catch. Now, if you were to ask me to remember that again, uh, probably not. But for the simple fact that this was the most prestigious game that I had from a yardage standpoint, it's always very close. So I'll always have the uh, Philadelphia uh, – Philadelphia, I'm sorry – uh, Eagles in, in in my heart over here. Thank you very much. <laughs> so then that leads me though, Tony. So if they worked in the game plan, how did Tom Landry react when you got to the sideline each each time you caught a pass that was not in the game plan? <laughs> and, and that's an interesting question, Margie. I mean, uh, the bottom line when when you have Captain come back, Captain America, I'm referencing Roger Staubach, he could pretty much do anything he want without any consequences. So if I caught the ball, I'd be close to Roger, so there would be no ill effects from that standpoint. <laughs> if for some reason I didn't, I'd go the opposite way of Roger and let them handle it. So I don't no. really know exactly what <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that was a good play. game plan on your part. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. You know, you stop and think of us, some of the things that you did. Did you have a favorite game? You think back to all the things you did I talked about as we introduced you, Super Bowl twelve, and, and, you know, you got the Super Bowl ring. Uh, anything else come to mind? You know, one of the premier games of, uh, that you'll always cherish. Anything come to oh, mind, Tony? There's no question at all. Uh, again, it, it takes a while for me to just to recall some of these things, but uh, I can never forget the famous comeback, the 35-34 win over the Washington Redskins. I mean, oh, I've had gosh, some really yeah. great games, but in that particular game, I caught the winning touchdown with um, right. about approximately 20 seconds to go in the game. Strange now, that, that was you, in 78, right? 78. Very it nice. sure was. Or 78 or 79. It might be 79. Was it 78? Seven, okay. 78 or 79. Again, yeah. you know, I, so 70 is kind of like a blob, but you know, they're, they're, they're a good blob. But uh-huh. in that game, you know, we, we talked to the contrast. We talked to the Roger Staubach. And again, I don't think the listeners or audience know that I was a quarterback in high school. Mm-hmm. And I wore uh, my favorite player, I wore number 12. My idol was Roger Staubach. I wanted to be like Roger Staubach, Joe Namath. Mm-hmm. And there was a guy by the name of Johnny Unitas that had a pretty mm-hmm. good feel. I, I kind of yeah. enjoyed watching him play. But anyway, so I haven't a chance to play with Guy Idol, but uh, we, we moved the ball down to the eight-yard line. I'm on the eight-yard line over here, and I, I told Raj, hey, there's a guy, I'm kind of, I can't think of his name, Lamar Parrish. He was playing defensive back for the Philadelphia, I mean, for the Washington Redskins. And I had been destroying him, as we'd say in our terminology, on these in routes. Uh, you know, six-yard, I mean, a 20-yard come across the middle. And his job was not to let me get inside, but I was able to get inside. So we get down there. And I said, Raj, I got this guy in my hip pocket. I can beat him on the, on a fade route. Uh, now, this is what I told him. And Raj said, as he used to say, he said, hey, all right, Tony, I'm calling this play. The play was designed for Billy Joe as a 17. It's designed for just Billy Joe. But we had fade route. He said, hey, if, if, he, if he gives you that inside move, I'm coming your way. If I look your way, I'm coming your way. <laughs> and so his version, I mean, uh, his version is that, hey, Tone, I'm going to hit you if you're wide open. So we have a contrast in versions, but we most certainly have the same result. He hit yeah. me. He, he threw me a pass with like eight seconds, 20 seconds to go in the corner of the end zone. As a wide receiver, we really don't like where he put the ball. He put the ball right in my hands. I mean, I like to be able to stretch out for it or dive for it, or at least have some type of <laughs> backup in case I did miss the ball. But he put it in the perfect place, and we ended up winning that game 35-34 as a comeback. And we had to win that game to make it to the playoffs. So that's good that's stuff. That's special yeah. yeah, that's that's great stuff. Tony Hill is our special guest here on Journey Through Sports and Life. We're back with more right after this. I'm with Welcome you, back as we continue on with yet another edition of Journey Through Sports and Life. And the man himself, great wide receiver from the Dallas Cowboys back in the late 70s into the 80s. We're talking about Thrill Hill, Tony Hill, number 80. And great to have you on board. Marty, go ahead, jump on board. Let's get this next segment going. What you got? All right. So, Tony, you went to school in California at Cal Poly, correct? Uh, Long Beach Poly. Long Beach Poly. Home of college and champions. You left that part out. 
<laughs> I lived in California for quite a while. Now, is that where Deshaun Jackson went to school also? Actually, Long Beach Poly has more high school uh, athletes in the NFL than any high school in the country. Deshaun Jackson, Willie McGinnis, Mercedes Lewis, who actually has plays on there. We've got a ton. Um, Gene Washington, uh, and actually, not to be a, so I'm not chauvinistic, uh, Billy Jean King went to my school. Cameron Diaz went to our school. So we're kind of loaded over there. How do you like yeah, that? Yeah, really? So, all right. So the coaching staff, obviously, going way back, must have been terrific. Who were your influences in high school? or how? I mean, we know that you wanted to be like your quarterback, but um, but who else was your influence or who were your mentors back then? Well, that's a great question. And, and the, the, the ironic thing about that, my mentor uh, was my dad. Uh, other than God being number one in my life, my family was number two. And my father went everywhere that I went. You know, I mean, it was to the point that, I, you know, I really didn't want him to be there. It was, it was, it was <laughs> embarrassing, but probably the best thing that ever happened in my life. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, in, in high school, the best thing that ever I was on a team that um, we were a one and 10 my junior year and I didn't play it down. So my future didn't look too hot. You know, I was a freshman as a, as a sophomore. I was on the junior, junior varsity team, but I was too young to play varsity. They wanted to move me up, but I was too young. And so the next year I get moved up, I'm playing on a varsity. I don't play it down and we're one in 10. So your, your career doesn't look too bright over there. So the, my, my dad wanted to pay me to go to another school because uh, he knew the kind of talent I had, just thought that they were just not, you know, being nice or, or, or playing favorites. And so the next year I went to Stanford. I mean, I went next year, my senior year, we went 10 and one. Uh, I was a quarterback and I was uh, out of all, only player on the team that received a scholarship. Uh, I was received a scholarship by well over, you know, over a thousand schools I had loaded over. And, and uh, the thing is that I, I, I was, I was 17 when I graduated from high school. Um, actually I was 16 turned 17 that year. Uh, um, but I, um, I was recruited by all over the country, but I was somewhat naive. I wanted to stay in tech in California. But California had what's called you know, was USC, where they pitched the ball to the right, pitched the hmm. ball to the left. UCLA had the wishbone. Uh, Cal, Cal Berkeley had a guy by the name, name of Steve Barkowski uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Vince Ferragamo. And so uh, I went to Stanford. And, and as a, they told me I could play quarterback, but I, I could feel on the field as a, as a wide receiver as a freshman because the quarterback was a guy by the name of Mike, Mike Barilla who was a second round draft pick for the Philadelphia Eagles. Go figure, how about that? Uh, so he was, a, he was a junior that year. And so I came on as a freshman and, and, I, and I played there. But a guy by the name of Gene Washington, he's, um, you know, he's a senior, you know, was, was much older than I. I played for the San Francisco 49ers. I broke all of his records in high school. He was a quarterback. I broke all of his records in high school. He went to Stanford and then went to the 49ers. And he said, hey, look, Tony, you know, I was a quarterback. Obviously, you were better than me because you broke my record. Uh, you didn't really see me play. But he said that, you know, here's, this is a great school. You know, it's a great opportunity. If you choose to go play, you know, play quarterback later on, you can. And so my freshman year, I, uh, I went to play. I decided to go to, I signed with Stanford and I went there and the, the music to my ear was that I, I would love to say I went there to gaze on their academics and I knew about it, but somewhat very minimal. Uh, the bottom line is that I knew they threw the ball 55 times a game. If I got one third of those, I have a chance in the NFL and lo and behold, God is great. God's on time all the time. I made it in the NFL. So that so was one of your was, goals then. Wow. Okay. Uh, it was my long-term goal. My <laughs> goal, I, I, you know, I, I, my goal was to be a professional athlete. That was my long-term, my, uh, uh, and immediate. Uh, my backup goal, I wanted to be an attorney. Oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's a good backup goal too. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I accomplished the first one, never got close to the second one other than graduating from school at 20 years old. Wow. And getting my degree, of course. So, so Stanford, you know, it's not, I have a brother and a nephew who are, are Stanford uh, graduate and one oh, currently nice. enrolled. That's, that's uh, probably, uh, you know, you say you went there because of the football and what the kind, what you'd be able to do as a quarterback. But then once you land there, even though you didn't know about the academics, were you a little bit like, whoa, you know, what's going on here? Or, or were you very well prepared for academics at that level? Because <laughs> at some point you must have found you know wow this is not your average school <laughs> marjorie that was that was a wow with a capital w when i got there <laughs> it, was, it was wow and whoa i gotta let me tell you right now uh you know 
hey, Stanford's not for the weak. Trust me, you know, if you, if you, you know, and because it's one that, you know, it's one that requires you to do your own due diligence and do your own work. It's not one of those that, I mean, it's not to say they didn't have a great support system. And then when I went there, I don't think it was a fantastic support system. Matter of fact, I'm certain that it was because most of the students were valedictorians from their school or they went to um, prep school. They came to Stanford. You know, they're the top 10 of their class, essentially. So they they had academic um, uh, study habits. You know, they were they were prepared for this. I mean, the biggest thing is going to college, Stanford, going to college at that level is being away from home because you, you have that. You, know, you have that resource at home, but if you went to a prep school and you're valedictorian, you're taking care of business. I was neither one of those two. I did well in school, but they, neither one of those two. Uh, so really, I mean, Stanford really took me to the limit. My my first year, uh, my first we were on quarters. We were on the quarter system. Yeah. My first quarter, I only had three units out of a possible eighteen. I tore my ACL that year, and so I was kind of I didn't know where I was. I was in I was in La La Land. I didn't know what, what I was going to do. All that I know that. All of a sudden now my football career seemed somewhat, you know, me, uh, college. I mean, I've only got three units because I didn't accomplish it. And, and uh, I had to sit down, you know, with the pops, you know, and, and it, it wasn't one that I wanted to leave. It's just like, hey, let's get it going, big guy. And so the next uh, the next two quarters, I had 18 units, 18 units. Uh, I had 20 and 20. And, you know, I had the, the, the amount of units that I needed and, and, and moved forward. But I, I had that drive. My drive was pretty peculiar. I had stand from one is that one. Uh, going to school again, I, I didn't want to fail. For the, it wasn't for me. I didn't realize it, although it was for me. I didn't want to embarrass my folks, and, mm-hmm. and you know, and that was a driving thing for me. I wanted. I didn't want to embarrass them, and so I it, that that was where that was my drive to make sure that no matter what it is, I'm going to finish the finish the line. Of course, after you, when you when you graduate and you know you, you become hindsight, you realize that hey, I was doing that for me, but. I always thought that that was my motivating factor. I didn't want to embarrass my parents. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this, Tony. You talk about, you know, the special, just the relationship you had with your parents and how your dad was your role model and just just uh, the nice close knit. And unfortunately, unfortunately, you don't see that so much today with uh, with young people. Uh, you don't have that, that, that family tie and what have you and the respect for the parents nearly as much as we did, say, in the older days. So I just wondered, if I, we've got about two minutes before we take a break. So I just wondered in the next couple of minutes, what would you share with an, with an audience right now? If you were asked to go back to, to Stanford and speak to these young people in a class about what it takes to be successful and be a leader in this world and be strong and be able to move forward in, in your life, in your family's life, what's the advice that you would give them about the things that are most important? Well, I'm going to allude to, to Marjorie's comment about what, what inspired you as a football player. Who did you look up to? I think we all have to find somebody to pattern ourselves after. I mean, IE for football was Roger Staubach. IE could be a scientist. IE could be somebody that's successful. And not necessarily to be that person, but to pattern yourself after the person. I always encourage everyone to be their own person. But you got to you, you need you need that guidance. Uh, the peculiar thing about that story, uh, Scott, and you talk about my father. My father and I were close uh, as far as sports. I mean, he made me, when I say made me practice, I wanted to practice, but he made me practice. There were times I didn't want to. And he said, hey, son, we're going to go out there and throw some balls. We're going to go out there and catch some balls. I didn't necessarily want to do that, or I didn't believe I wanted to, uh, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And, and so I instill those values in my kids. I mean, I, I want to be an on-hands uh, father. So a, a perfect example of this, though, which is really crazy. My dad always said, hey, you know, Tony or Anthony used to call me. He said, man, if you can play like those guys, you're going to be in the NFL one day. And so as long as you don't get injured. So when I get to Stanford, long story short, I tore my ACL my freshman year, and that's the first time I ever seen my father cry. And it just mm. tore me to tears. And that was another incentive to keep going. But he continued. When I went back to home, I couldn't, I could barely walk. Guess who was out there catching balls with me, just throwing me balls when nobody else wanted to pay attention to me? My dad was out there. He came, he never missed any of my home games. I mean, my mom and my dad went to everything, he participated. And you know what? At that time, not necessarily that when he was coming to the game, I didn't I didn't necessarily really want him to be there. I mean, I wanted him to be there, but I didn't want him to be that mm. close. But I, I appreciate it so much more now. The funny thing, I'll try to close with that, of course, having somebody inspire you, give you directions, what's all about, might happen to be my father and my mom. Uh, the thing is, though, here's the crazy thing about this closing. So my senior year, I was always one of the top in the league, or the junior, I was top. I was like seventh in the nation receiving. And after that season, my father goes, comes up to me. My father had a ninth grade education. Uh, he ended up graduating, you know, in, you know, junior college, whatever it is, while I was at home, you know, as a, as a kid. 
Well, he had a ninth grade education. And then one day after the game, he says, hey, now, you know, we've been together a long time ago. Next year, when you go to pro, I'm going to be your agent. And you know, <laughs> and, and you know what? I co-signed that deal. I said, yeah, and, and, and I kind of forgot about it, you know, because I had agents coming to me left and right, and I, and I was really ready to sign with this other guy. And, and my dad goes, hey, well, I'm glad we got this etched in stone. I'm going to be your guy, right? And I said, okay. <laughs> and so he, I mean, his knowledge was general. I mean, about about alpha, but I didn't know one thing that anything and everything he would do, he believed it was in my best interest. Yeah. You know what? You can't beat that at all. You, you know, mm-hmm. really. So Coach Walsh was the one who helped my dad negotiate that my con my contract with the you know, San Francisco 49ers. And my dad was my was my agent the whole time. There were some pluses and there were some negatives. The one thing is that he wouldn't let me spend any money. Uh, the good news is I <laughs> saved some money. You know, yeah. it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty tough when you're 23, 24, 25, and you're hiding dollars from your dad because you don't want <laughs> to know you, you're spending money over here. So uh, what a treat. But that's that that that's I hope that answered your question, but that's that's what it took for me. That's, yeah, a that's, a, that's a great, great answer. Great answer. Tony Hill, former wide receiver with the Dallas Cowboys, one of the top 100 players of all time with America's team. He was something special at wide receiver. And we're going to be back with more as we continue on with this edition of Journey Through Sports and Life. Once again, we welcome you back. Great to have you on board as we head through the month of December and our special guest, Former wide receiver with the Dallas Cowboys, Braille Hill, the man they call Tony Hill, number 80. And we're delighted to welcome Tony. And of course, uh, I'm Scott, along with Marnie and Marjorie. And Marjorie, why don't you uh, kick us off this segment? Okay, well, I'm curious, Tony, when you were playing at one point, you know, there there you were, uh, you were playing also with Drew Pearson and Tony Dorsett. Uh, what was it like in the locker room talking about what, how often you want to get the ball thrown to you? You know, there were, you know, there were just so many plays to go around. How was that? That was, that was a very difficult yet. Um, I, I would say we were uh, consistent in terms of, in terms of our conversation. Throw me the ball more. I want to go <laughs> yeah. back. You know, Margie, you know, here's the deal. Uh, you know, uh, you know I, as I mentioned to you, and I was being sincere, but Tony and I came on, we called ourselves the TNT Connection, the beast from the east and the best from the west. Yeah. Uh, and I know that you guys have my stats, but you know, I led the team in receiving nine out of the 10 years that I played, mm-hmm. not only in catches, but in, 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 um, uh, in yardage. Uh, and um, the only year that I didn't lead, it was my, my rookie year. And I only got two passes. And those two passes, Drew had got hurt. I was back and Drew up, he got hurt. He went to the sidelines. Rogers throws me two passes, and all of a sudden, Drew has this miraculous recovery, and he's back on the field, and I'm, I'm back out. Uh, but the 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 bottom 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 line is that um, you know we 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 all wanted passes in our direction. We and, and see, we played in an era that was somewhat limited as far as the passes. Specifically, right. our team. We were a ball control team. We were a team that you're going to run the ball twice, and we're going to throw that other pass, and occasionally we might surprise you and run a uh, pass the ball on first down with a play action, but. We were basically a, a run throw team. And, you know, I, I believe a Roger had been a system where they threw the ball, they had this, um, you know, this, they're throwing the ball 50 times a game, 40 times a game. Excuse me. We would have been exceptional as far as our, our receptions and, and, and probably his stats. I, I don't think mm-hmm. you can compare the stats based on we only knew five balls were coming in our direction. Drew knew only five balls in direction. Tony's going to get 20 balls. It, you know, it kind of shorted things up. But the thing is, it made us better as, you know, as players. And it made us close yet distant to a certain degree because we were competitive. Uh, yeah. You know, the great thing about this scenario, uh, Drew's in the Hall of Fame in the Ring of Honor, and he clearly goes in and says, hey, he wouldn't be there without me and that I should be in both those. Uh, you know, how does a guy lead the team in receiving? How does a guy uh, in yardage? How does a guy have more yardage than me and not be considered or has not been mentioned? You know what? Coming from a guy who's, you know, that 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 I, I, I was very special to me. You know, he was one that, that I... I I wanted to pattern myself after him because he was, he was successful. And, and coming from a teammate like that, you know, that shows what it's all about. You know, we were, we were a close guy. Again, he's in there. And he's, he's petitioning and saying that he wouldn't be in there without me and that I should be there. You know, what, what else more can you ask? And, of course, he's going to be at the party as well, Scott. And so for our listeners out there, yeah, you guys get out there. Let them know Tony Hill needs to be in there. Uh, that's I, enough on I think, for that. Tony, I'm surprised that you're not. I mean – Yes, absolutely. I'll certainly endorse that. I'll be like, look, this guy made young girls cry. 
<laughs> and he's well, a really yeah. nice guy. So there you uh, go. <laughs> well, it's, it's a blessing, though. You know, hey, you know, it's a blessing to play for Coach Landry. Uh, you know, for, for uh, you know, obviously your idol. You know, you're playing with your idol, uh, Tony Dorsett. I mean, this guy's phenomenal. He's a phenomenal runner. You know, uh, the stat. Tony, Drew, and I. We were the first three first three group in the NFC to have over a thousand yards. AFC had Charlie Joyner, uh, Jefferson, and uh, Winslow. They had a thousand yards, oh. but we were the first from the NFC to ever accomplish that. And so that's a major feat. We both had Drew and I had a thousand, and Dorsett had a thousand yards. We were the first ones to have that over there. So that kind of shows the camaraderie we had, so to speak, uh, and then the success that we had. You know, one of the things of being a Dallas Cowboy, even more so than now, because we, we were America's team and bringing it up. Everybody wanted to beat our butts because we were America's team. Because how did you guys get labeled America's team? Why are you guys America's team? And that inspired the teams that were, you know, every on every game, we wouldn't have a downside. I think the, the climate has changed a little bit with the Cowboys because they haven't had the success that they've had like we have. But every time we play, if we, there was a 2-10 and 10 team, you can bet they're going to play their best game against us. And that came with the territory. And I think that's what made us what, what we are. Coach Landry, and I'll close on this, told me one thing really quick. He told he called me in one day, and I think it's inspired me not only now, but it has a tremendous impact on my family life as a whole. He said, Tony, I just want to, I just want to let you know something. There are two types of individuals in this world today. The one that live by one that live by preferences and one that live by com, com, conviction. Which one are you going to be? You might not like what I have to say, but you can believe whatever I say is the way it's going to be, especially with me. It's not going to be one of these scenarios that – you know, because uh, you don't like what I said, I'm going to change my tone. No, that's not the way it's going to be. I'm convicted to my my, my 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 actions, my performance, whatever I do, and this is the way it's going to be. It totally impacted my life as far as my family because I wanted to be that person for my wife and for my kids. And so that is something that came from the Cowboys. So I'm truly blessed. All right, wait, um, I was just going to ask you, wait, Tony, can you repeat that saying? I was going to ask you what your favorite saying is. Can you repeat that for our listeners? Because it's yeah. so important. He said there's two there's two types of individuals in this world. He said the one that lives by preferences, they can tell you the sky's blue and you come and tell them it's red, and they'll just change that conversation and say, hey, it's red. Or they can live by conviction and say, hey, it's blue. That's what I see blue, and that's the way it's going to be. And there are two types of individuals. What type of individual do you want to be? Do you want to be somebody who just coasts on the sideline, or do you want to be somebody that stands up for something? Live by preference or live by convictions? I chose C, live by conviction. Wow, that's really that's really powerful. Yeah, it really is. Very, very, very strong. And in in the relationship you you talk about with uh, with players is uh, really special too. America's team. We we're talking about the fact that you got that Super Bowl ring back in 1978. That's when NFL Films, and they're the ones that came up with the title America's Team oh. NFL Film. Mm -hmm. And that was 1978. It was after you all won the Super Bowl. And they said, how do we talk about this team? Because you remember the Steelers, <laughs> Terry Bradshaw, they won four Super Bowls back in the decade of the 70s. And and yet we were, half of those were up against the Cowboys for Pete's sake. But yeah, you, you, you would, team. Yeah, go ahead. You would say, you would say that, Scott. I mean, half of the work is, uh, you know, I, 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 played in, I played in five NFC championship games. You know, I played in two Super Bowls and five NFC championship games. So I've, I've had a great career, but the crazy thing about that, five NFC championships could have been five Super Bowls. You know, we went back Absolutely. to back. You know, we played the Los Angeles Rams, the Philadelphia yeah. Eagles, the Washington Redskins, San Francisco 49ers. Those, hey, all, and then, of course, when we played the, um, I think it was the uh, Tampa Bay Bucks or the Minnesota Vikings in the championship. But that's five right. NFC championships could, you know, most certainly change your career. But the fact is that, you know what, I am totally blessed. How many people get a chance? Not only playing the Super Bowl, but to play in the NFC Championship games. You know, yeah. we went up to Philadelphia. And I'm, it's so freaking cold up there, Marty. Marty, I just want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Wilbur yeah. Montgomery ran for 1,400 million yards. And Harold Carmichael and, <laughs> and all these guys had, you know, had fantastic games. Of all days, they'd have to have it that day, and the weather would have to be like. 3,000 below degrees you know, temperature. It was <laughs> a very, I, I still think I'm, I, I'm cold from that day, but we, Philly fans got a little warm towards, you know, <laughs> at the end of the game, they warmed up <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But yes, that was quite a game for Philadelphia. I, I you know. Did the, you have a favorite city that you like to go to? You're, you're kidding around about the, the Eagles, you know, on behalf of Marty and her family. How about uh, a, a team that you love to go to, to play against, in a team, a city that you didn't want to ever go to again? What comes to mind? 
Well, I, I, I love to go to Washington because of the rivalry that we had. And I've had mm -hmm. an abundance of success. But if, we could have, if I could have got Washington on our on, on our schedule for like 200 games, there would be no question that I'd be in the Pro Bowl. There's no way that they could ignore the fact of what I've accomplished. Uh, now, of course, don't tell the, don't tell the Redskins fans. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, so, and, and, and they really hated the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, they had, you know, we, we fly into, and I can't think of the name of the city, uh, I think it starts with an M. As soon as you get into the capital, uh, no, Crystal City, I think is that it. Uh, but anyway, we'd stay over there in the office buildings, like, you know, go back home, Cowboys. We hate Cowboys. <laughs> this is their office buildings over here. You know, it's like, uh, you know, we were coming from a, an event one night and we're stuck in the capital, but we're coming get back to the hotel. We had to be there for a um, uh, curfew. And, um, and we were like, we could see the hotel. I could walk to the hotel in two minutes, but the cars weren't moving at all, right? And so we saw this police officer and we said, hey, sir, you know, I got to be at Kurt. We, 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 we disclosed, fully disclosed who we were and said, hey, I got to be at the hotel in 10, you know, 10 minutes. Can you help us out? Just give us a court over and just help us out. He said, no, get back in the car. You know? oh. So he said, that, I would never do that for the Cowboys. Oh. And, and so, you know, now we go back to the car, we're contemplating, what are we going to do? Hey, let's just get out and walk. And the officer comes back and we're thinking he's going to tell us something, you know, terrible. He says, hey, follow me. And he pulled us out and took us to the hotel. Granted, he was very nice, but we only had two minutes to get to our room. Now, understand this. Not not to be in the hotel. You have to be in your room in two minutes. Oh, the elevator's going real slow. You know, there's 14 million people in the lobby. And you talk about losing hair and sweat. That, that might have been one of the most difficult moments of my life. Wow. That process. Um so I love to go there. Places that I really, I don't know, that, that's a good question for the simple fact that I didn't like going to Houston. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the Astrodome. I mean, the city was cool. The stadium was the pits. Um, oh, yeah. You know, um, Philadelphia was a little rude for us over there. I got to tell you right now, we, <laughs> we go to Philadelphia and they tell you, don't take your helmets off. Because hey, <laughs> after the game was over, you kept your helmets on because people were throwing stuff at us. Yeah. And we were getting bottles, coins, you know. They weren't throwing any dollar bills. That's the only important <laughs> thing. Uh, but other, other than that, you know, God, you know, the NFL's got some really great cities, you know, that we had a chance to play in. So. Well, then you ought to tell them about your book series. Oh, what do you mean? My, oh, my book series. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, Tony, well, I'll get books for your grandkids. Yes, I, I'm writing a series of books called Football Freddy, and Freddy's a girl, and Fumble the Dog, this is Fumble, Game uh, in the uh, USA. And each book takes you on a tour through a different NFL city. So mm -hmm. uh, we get to share all these great historical sites in the cities, like in Dallas, Fort Worth, and then you end up at the stadium to cheer on the home team because I think being a football fan is really the greatest thing. And certainly I, I love... Uh, I love the fact that I had the opportunity to learn football, and I think sports really are the universal language for sure. Awesome, awesome. You know, it's, it's you, you say that uh, probably one of my big moments in my life as well. Of course, going to the Pro Bowl, playing in the Super Bowl, being on the superstar, super teams was really memorable moments in my football athletic career. But we were in Thousand Oaks, and Scott. I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but I was on a book that's called Football is for Me, and essentially it was me and a seven-year-old who was a Tony Hill fan. We had my helmet and, you know, and walking around. It was an episode or, or, or a feature based on him that was in all the elementary schools. And it always talked mm. about stretching. It, it, you can look it up. Football's for me. Um, um, was a huge moment. That was my second year in the league. It was, after, it was my third year in the league uh, after I had the really big sophomore year. And, and I'll tell you what, Tony, me. let me interrupt you. we got to quick, take a quick break. Hold that right there, and we'll be back with more on Journey Through Sports and Life. Welcome back to Journey Through Sports and Life. And down the home stretch, uh, just a couple of minutes left. But uh, Tony, go ahead and pick up the rest of that story, what you were sharing with us before the break. Oh, no worries. But anyway, long story short, I was sharing with the listeners of that. That is this young man, uh, a little kid who was a big fan of mine. Um, and they did a book called Football is for Me. It was it just talked all about the basic essentials of being a football player, what it takes, you know. Uh, and it had pictures of he and I on, on there. And I do, I have it at my house and I share it with my kids. And when I used to speak to kids, uh, I, I, I used to show them this book. Uh, and, and so anyway, long story short, I think that was, a, you know, Marnie was talking about her journey to the stadium. My journey at training camp, 
that was a huge endeavor, not an endeavor, but a huge plus just being inspired, knowing somebody, you know, cared about you. My long range goal as a football player, as a football player, you know, was to have somebody want to be like Tony Hill. And so I wanted to lead that type of, that type of life. And I was young, I had a lot of fun while I was playing, there's no question about it, but I most certainly wanted to be a memorable experience and I was always wanted to be a positive uh, thought in, in our community. That's fantastic. Well, have you had fun here on the uh, journey through sports and life? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I, I can't recall this journey. This has been great. I'm just going back. I, <laughs> I can probably talk forever. I'm, I'm your wrong guy that you have on this one. <laughs> we'll just no, have no, to get you great. on the show again. That's all. Right. Right. Tony, yeah, have... do you have a specific item that's like in your man cave or a favorite piece of memorabilia? <laughs> Uh, you know what I do? Uh, well, it's not a fair, but I got a few. I wish I was at the house, I, and I just came into the office. I wish I was at the house because I've got some pictures. I love this picture with you and the dog and the black tights and et cetera. I don't know what, what the rest of it is over there, but it looks like it's a pretty cool. I think that's your, is that about your book or something like that? It is, yeah. yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Um, but on my wall, I've got a, I've got a picture of, I've got a, a, a signature of the superstars. See, nobody's seen the superstars because like 1,400 years ago, you know, of course. So anybody, somebody comes to my house and says, well, you're on the superstars? <laughs> what, what, what is the superstars, you oh, know? Yeah. And it had Roger Craig, Evander Holyfield. Um, God, oh, the, very cool. Carl, yeah. Col uh, the, 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 um, God, the the volleyball player, Karach, Karach. You know, Scott, you know what I'm talking about, Kyle Karach? Yeah, Karach, I do, Karach, and I can't yeah. think of the name. I know yeah, exactly uh, what you mean. Mark yeah. Gastineau. Um, oh, we're gosh. Talking, yeah, we're talking about some names. But the bottom line is that that always, you know, like, who are you? You know, I mean, my, my kids come in, well, who, who, who is this guy? I'll tell you one of the funniest, <laughs> this is a really funny story to me. I don't know if we have time, but. We, we got about 30 seconds. Oh, I don't have time for this study. We'll have to okay. do it another time. Well, oh, can, we no. get you, can we get you on again? Absolutely. You guys are All fantastic. Right. I, my right. daughter's a speech pathologist. And long story short, I'll make this short, but I promise. Uh, um, she went to see some kids at a school. I went to visit her at school. And long story short, the kids got a chance to meet me. I got to tell you about this story four years later. So next time we talk, you're going to love this one. Done deal. Former oh Dallas Cowboy God. wide receiver, Tony Hill, our special guest. <laughs> Only one. Thanks, way. Tony. You're the best. Stay well, my friend. Hey, thank you, Todd. See you <laughs> on January you, 7th, buddy. Wait, stay on so we can take a picture. Yep. Okay. So until next time, I'm Scott Murray <laughs> for Marjorie and Marnie, Journey Through Sports and Life. Stay well.